one. Excellent. And here I am. I'm with Greg Foss. Greg, how are you today? Things are great. Thanks, Sonny. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. Uh, so, Greg, you know, usually I start with uh, kind of like where maybe we met or how long ago we met. You know, I, I think our paths crossed maybe more recently, right? Well, it's funny. Um, so it did uh, with our involvement in 3IQ, but uh, I did see you speak uh, in Miami almost five years ago at the North American Bitcoin Conference when... Um, I think there were maybe 800 people who signed up for the conference. And the only one that jammed the room was uh, McAfee. And then everyone else was, you know, got some good reception, but not huge of the 800 attendees. Then the next year that I went there, there was, it was ridiculous. It was held in a basketball stadium. And, uh, you know, you realize that the, uh, the altcoin uh, mania was on us because it was no longer North American Bitcoin conference. It was uh, blockchain and altcoins and everything. So yeah, five years ago we met and then we crossed path crossed paths at with our involvement in Three IQ. Right, right, right. I do remember that conference. And I remember, I remember, I remember your face and vaguely. Uh, maybe I think we might have even met uh, during that time. Maybe not. Uh, but uh, but okay. So let's. And, and you know, as I was mentioning to you earlier, um, I, I, I'm I always say that you know Bitcoin is like just ones and zeros, right, on on the internet or whatever. Um, it's really a function of you know the people around it. Uh, in fact, I, I don't know if you had a chance to check it out, but I, I recently just interviewed today, in fact, Michael Sunshine from Grayscale, and they talked about that they, I think, had acquired something like $700 million in Bitcoin in the last 24 hours. I mean, it is insane what is happening. And and I was reading through, um, you know, your your history as well. I mean, I'm super excited to get into it. Um, and so, so just to set the context, you know, really just interested in your story, uh, maybe prior to learning about Bitcoin and then post Bitcoin. Uh, and then maybe we can segue into, you know, some of the exciting projects uh, that, you know, you've been a part of and and you're, you know, that you continue to support. So I'm, I'm, I'm pumped. So let's start there. And, and like I said, some people start with, uh, uh, their great grandparents. Some people start with their first job. I really don't care. Where, where, you know, wherever wherever you feel comfortable. Awesome. Well, thank you. You're too, you're too kind. Um, you know, you you would not have remembered me from uh, the North American Bitcoin Conference. you uh, you were on stage, and I was a plebe, but I'm still a plebe, and I'm proud of it. So um, <laughs> here's what I know. Uh, in I'm an engineer by training. Um, I do. Uh, like mathematics, I respect I respect mathematics, and I'm okay at mathematics. I'm better than your average person. I'm not great by engineering standards, but uh, McGill Engineer, who knew that I never really wanted to be a practicing full-time engineer, and I went down and received uh, an MBA in the United States, and I came back to Canada, and my first job in Canada was working for the head office of Royal Bank which is pretty intense. My hometown of Montreal, uh, Royal Bank had a split head office, part in uh, Toronto, part in Montreal in 1988. So I went back to my hometown, worked for Canada's largest financial institution. And one of my first jobs was uh, pricing our lesser developed country loan portfolio, LDC. A lot of people think it stands for... uh, Latin American debt, but it's not. It's lesser developed country of which Latin America played a large role. So we had about a billion dollars worth of Mexican debt. And Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady came out with a plan to restructure the Mexican debt of most uh, uh, global money center banks. Everyone had exposure. There was petrodollars flowing around the world. They turn around and lend it to uh, countries in South America as well as around the world. Uh, But the US dollar obligations uh, became much more expensive when there was a currency crisis in Latin America. So let's fast forward and say we had a billion dollars of exposure. There wasn't much trading that uh, that was happening in Latin American debt at the time, but on average, the debt was trading at 25 cents on the dollar. 
Brazil was a little stronger. Mexico was right around 25 cents. Philippines, Vietnam didn't trade much. But again, 25 cents on the dollar. We had 4 billion cumulative exposure at the Royal, which meant on a mark-to-market basis, we had to write down $3 billion. Simple math, right? $4 billion loans, five-year loans, trading at 25 cents on the dollar, bad mistake. You're a trader, you got to write down your book. Okay, I run to the financial, uh, the balance sheet. I'm working for the CFO. I look and I say, "Uh uh-oh, we don't even have $3 billion of book value of equity to mark down our book. This is horrible. I'm working at the largest financial institution in Canada, and it's insolvent in 1988. And not only that, it reflected the balance sheets of every single money center bank in New York, at the time, Manufacturers Hanover, Chase Manhattan, all these banks have since been uh, merged. Uh, But the truth was, every single money center bank in in, uh, North America had exposure. And if you marked it to market, the banking system was insolvent. And this is my introduction to, wow, finance, this is something crazy. Why is it that banks can have high credit ratings when they are 25 times levered to their equity position? Meaning, for a typical loan, there's only four cents of every dollar that is equity capital or risk absorbing capital. And the other 96 cents is made up of subordinate debt and depositors money. Well, that's the banking system. And that was my introduction to fiat. And I said, oh my Lord, this thing is crazy. So I was always looking for a a solution to uh, fiat. Uh, Over my 30 year trading history, I've been Canada's first high yield bond trader. I worked at a number of hedge funds, including Griffiths McBurney Investment Management with Mike Weckerly, who probably if you're Canadian, you may have heard of him. He was on Dragon's Den. He's a colorful, colorful guy, Canada's best equity trader, in my opinion. And uh, we did some pretty cool stuff in capital structure arbitrage. It was the credit crisis in 2008, so I lived through that. I will assure you that all financial institutions were insolvent again at that time. And again, I had never found the solution to this fiat conundrum where a bank maintains a high credit rating because it has an implied backstop from the federal government. But what is that backstop? Essentially, it's the the ability to print money. And that, as a financial engineer, was very concerning to me. So our huge trade at GMP Investment Management involved the restructured asset-backed commercial paper in Canada, which was a huge debacle in Canada. It was basically leveraged super senior debt. It was sold by U.S. investment banks into, I'm not going to say unsuspecting Canadian accounts, but how about foolish Canadian investment accounts. And that paper went from 100 cents on the dollar down to about 20 cents on the dollar. Uh, There was 32 billion of it in Canada. The case that they pulled last month's Quebec, my hometown pension fund owned 10% of their assets in And we're back. Uh, Okay, let's go. Sorry, and uh, so, To to recap, basically, I worked at GMP Investment Management with WEC, and uh, we had the opportunity to participate in the best trade of my career, which was restructured asset-backed commercial paper. Uh, That was a $32 billion debacle in Canada. Now, $32 billion is a meaningful amount uh, by any measure, but there were the largest uh, Quebec pension fund, Case de de Depoy Place Mons, Quebec, own 10% of their assets in asset-backed commercial paper that they purchased at the wrong price from U.S. investment banks and decided not to roll over their exposure when they determined there was some subprime U.S. mortgage exposure in that ABCP. The, the, the price of it, the asset-backed commercial paper fell from close to 100 cents on the dollar down to 20 cents on the dollar. 
And the case was basically a seller at the lows in the market, which meant they, they had exposure of $16 billion. A back of the envelope calculation would mean they lost at least $10 billion of Quebec pensioner money because they were not informed as to the true risk of the assets that they were buying. And the U.S. investment banks had a buyer, big fish on, and guess what? The U.S. Invest investment banks were transferring risk into Canada and they ripped the face off of the case. So what does all that mean? It means you better understand credit because credit makes the world go round and it's an asymmetric distribution to the downside. If you don't understand it, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna pay for it. And uh, I believe though, at the end of the day, the financial system survived the 2008 great financial crisis again because of printing money. So what does that mean, Sonny? It means we kicked the can down the road I was looking for a solution to this fiat conundrum that I'd been introduced to in 1988, and I found Bitcoin. And I believe it's the greatest technological and financial innovation that I've seen in my 30 plus years of trading credit and trading risk. It is just a thing of beauty. I went down to that, uh, that Bitcoin, North American Bitcoin fund, uh, excuse me, conference. Um, you know, I've seen, I saw trade block in action, the tradeblock.com, watching the blockchain, watching the hashes, watching the transactions, the mempool, seeing how it functioned as an engineer, it was pure beauty and I was hooked. 2016, Bitcoin was at 800 bucks US and I just said, this is what I've been searching for for over 25 years. Five years ago, 25 years, I'd been searching for the solution. And that's where our paths crossed most recently because you also were involved with 3IQ. I was a founding shareholder at 3IQ, very proud. And 3IQ now manages over a billion dollars of assets for Canadians on behalf, uh, with it. they get exposure to the Bitcoin asset class. And it's a beautiful thing. Good for them. So proud of them. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a tiny advisor type of role, but uh, yeah, proud of the team and great. Uh, good on you to be, you know, I think you're one of the founding uh, shareholders, right? So Fred Pye came to me in 2016 and said, um, you know, this is what it is. And I was immediately intrigued. Uh, he still lived in Montreal. I was in Toronto, but uh, have some business interests in Montreal. Uh, off the record, it's an Irish pub, more than one of them in Montreal. We met at the Irish pub and he showed me. And the, the thing that he showed me that convinced me again was this, this is it. This is the blockchain, the first blockchain ever. It's called Bitcoin decentralized. Here it is transferring value across the world with no intermediary. And again, as an engineer, wow, I, that rabbit hole opened and I, didn't jump down it. I tumbled down it and I've never come back, you know, never come back. Hey, hey Greg, you know, uh, 3IQ is one of those phenomenons where like ever since I heard about it too, I was like, Fred is this like insane genius who's, you know, obviously working on something amazing. Uh, there's a really high chance of failure, but, uh, but you know, um, if he wins, he'll win big. But it's really hard to even explain to like everyone or to people around me that, that this was something that was, you know, important. What do you think? So, but if you had to explain it, not to, let's say your finance friends, but like, just like, I don't know, but like a, a 10 year old kid or something like what 3IQ did in a nutshell, what would you say they did or what they enabled or whatever? So very simply, uh, so Fred had this, uh, this vision and mm. uh, good on him. He'd been involved in one of Canada's first uh, ETF-like structures, if I'm not mistaken, which was a gold, uh, a gold offering, a gold ETF offering. And uh, so he had experience in the space, but the gentleman that, uh, that really won it for uh, 3IQ was uh, our old CIO. Uh, his name is Sean Cumby. Uh, Sean and I had worked together in various capacities over the last 20 years. 
uh, Sean and I worked together at TD Securities, trading credit default swaps and tra trading high yield credit at TD Securities. Sean is one of the most diligent and uh, detail oriented individuals I've ever met. Mm. And Sean won. Sean, we took, 3IQ took the Ontario Securities Commission to the courts when they declined our first application. And Sean put together 5,000 pages, 5,000 pages of information and went on the stand and blew the commissioner out of his chair. And 3IQ, Fred had the vision and Sean had the moxie. Yeah, what a what an epic story. There will be probably movies made about that someday. <laughs> you know, here we are in Canada. So, you know, the truth is, no. But, no. <laughs> but, but the good thing is, uh, Sean Cumbie is responsible for the creation of wealth. Uh, I'm going to guesstimate that the average price that, uh, you know, I would say there's $500 million at most of proceeds that have come into uh, 3IQ. And the balance is uh, capital appreciation of the asset, the Bitcoin asset. So, you know, Canada's made a good little pass there. And that's what we're supposed to do, right? Um, mm -hmm. we, are, we are a G7 nation, but in reality, we're 3,000 or 5,000 kilometers long and 100 miles wide. And most Americans can't find us on a map. So we are what we are. There will be no movies made about 3IQ or a Sean Kemby. <laughs> um, hey, I was gonna say, you know, just to rewind back to your story. However, I wanted to ask you something. So, uh, so, so, so you you talked about something really big there, right? Like you had this experience where you'd worked for almost 20, 25 years. You had this like feeling that something was wrong, and you used words that I, I'll be honest, I totally get, right? Um, but I, I, I'm really like trying to make sure that like because like, there's so many people that are interested in this space now, right? And I want to make sure I kind of speak to them. But again, if we were to use layman's terms, Greg, what 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 was your takeaway? Um, if I were to try and summarize, was it the money's not even there? <laughs> or what is it? Like, you know, what, what was your main like, aha? <laughs> well, I, okay, so on two fronts, I guess you're talking about the fiat, the fiat side. Um, it's sort of the, I... I, I Imagine if you have a mortgage and you can print money in your basement. How neat would that be? I don't ever have to make good on, on my obligation by earning it. I'll just mm. print money in my basement and pay off my mortgage. So the aha moment for me is, look, all these fiat nations, uh, you know, we went from Bretton Woods to being a gold standard and then off the gold standard and trust me, fiat, trust, trust that there's something there. Well, as a bond trader, you know, as Ronald Reagan would say, trust but verify. Well, what really is there? Um, you know, I traded high yield bonds my whole career. Mm -hmm. If I put the balance sheet of Rogers Communications, which is Canada's largest cable and wireless company, and was once the largest high yield borrower in the world, not in Canada, Ted Rogers was the largest high yield bond borrower in the world financed out of the U.S. high yield market, if I okay. put his balance sheet against the balance sheet of the government of Canada, even 20 years ago, if I didn't say which balance sheet was which, and based on operating cash flows and debt leverage, which one would you say is the better credit? And people hands down would pick the government, excuse me, would pick Rogers Communications over the government of Canada without disclosing what the, who the borrower was. The point is, people don't understand how poor the balance sheets of the governments really are. The only thing they have is a AAA credit rating, which is a subjective rating from the credit rating agencies, and the credit rating agencies, well, they can print money. They can also tax, but really the real thing they can do is print money. And therefore, they are at very low risk of default. Well, that's a bit of a circular logic, right, Sonny? Because if you print so much money, the dollars that you're left with are getting halved each time you double the money supply. Um, it just means you'll get your money back from the government, but when you lend a dollar after 20 years, you get the equivalent of 50 cents back. 
It's really, really sad. People don't understand it. No, they have not defaulted on their obligation. It's just that your purchasing power has been halved. And that's what fiat money is. And that's no good for my kids that I'm trying to pass wealth. So Michael Saylor, who's a brilliant engineer and CEO of MicroStrategy, summed it up extremely eloquently when he said, look, conservation of energy, the first law of thermodynamics. Bitcoin is energy. It's the ability to transfer your time and work and energy that you put into earning value today. You can transfer it into the future for consumption in the future, and it will not be debased. You will not lose a value because they're just printing more of this thing called, uh, you know, this unlimited supply of this thing called fiat currency. Yeah, yeah, beautifully said. Uh, and and wow, and it's like I used to be a financial advisor like a long time ago, and I've literally been across the dinner table of like thousands of families. Um, and I learned one thing that that nine out of ten families, and maybe it's even ninety five out of a hundred now or something, um, <clears throat> live paycheck to paycheck. There's always more month than money. Um, after taxes and paying interest, they're left with half of what they earn and then they've got to pay the bills and it's just a mess. It's just a mess. But I, but I also kind of came away with this understanding that like financial advisors, they do what they can with these limited tools. But when the, the fundamental system itself is flawed, <laughs> like, you I mean, you can, it's like trying to put a bandaid on a sinking ship. Like, I mean, come on. Um, okay. One more thing I want to really, really, really bring up. Okay. So did you see the news today about uh, Harper? Well, uh, perhaps uh, it's been out there for a couple of days where he, he mentioned it? that uh, Bitcoin could be a, a reserve currency. Is that what you're? Yeah. Wanting? So just thoughts on uh, that. I mean, because I don't know that that that's been my kind of wild, like, oh, if that could happen this year, like, so uh, you know, it won't I happen this year, right? It won't happen quickly, but it will, in my opinion, happen over time. And this is how it happens. And it's talk to me. It's it is it is, uh, you know. I'm using my engineering background. So that's okay. Let's go. Is, <laughs> I'm an engineer too, so I can maybe uh, keep up. <laughs> I love it. And you'll get this because Sailor is the man. Okay. Michael Sailor. Yeah, I, have a, I have a man crush on him too. <laughs> so, he explains it. So, you know, what is Bitcoin? Well, it's the purest form of monetary energy there is. Okay. Monetary energy, digital energy. So I, I like that. Okay. I absolutely believe that all energy will someday be priced in Bitcoin. It's a natural evolution. So think if you're Saudi Arabia or if you're Russian in particular, your valuable resources that you're digging out of the ground or pumping out of the ground are being paid for in debasing US dollars. And on your balance sheet, you own a ton of US treasuries and reserve assets. Well, the solution actually is to be paid in Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin is digital energy. It closes that loop. Okay. So sell energy to receive energy, sell energy out of the ground and convert it into a store of value as energy for future consumption. Would you rather as a Russian own Bitcoin or debasing US dollars? I think the answer is pretty clear. I would say it's the same for most oil producing and energy producing nations around the world, including Canada. So I believe that all energy will one day be priced in Bitcoin. It's logical. Electricity should be priced in Bitcoin. None of this unit of account fiat craziness. Therefore, when that happens, I think Stephen Harper is right. I think that the US dollar will be replaced as the world reserve currency slash asset when that happens. It won't happen quickly, Yeah, yeah. but like in credit, it happens slowly and then suddenly, okay? Everything's mm. fine until someone peels a layer of the, the onion and says, wow, this is real. So I think it's going to happen. I'm not going to put a time on it. And I'm not going to say that the US dollar doesn't maintain its uh, global reserve currency status for a good long time. Um, there will be hundreds of fiat currencies that fail before the US dollar, including the Canadian dollar, by the way, okay? Um, I'm big into credit default swaps. 
Uh, I've traded credit my whole life. We can touch on that at one point, but that may be above the uh, the level of conversation you want to go to. But again, oh no, I'm I'm willing to go deep too. I just wanted to make sure we level set at least and got sure. everybody on board. You know, I'm ready to go where anywhere. But uh, but continue. Sorry, um, and I want to get into the Alberta stuff eventually, right? Sure. Uh, the energy stuff as well. That's super fascinating to me. Well, it's all good, and and so there's no um there's no but time like, frame. All yeah, the markets are so price. Uh, markets are truth in my mind. Okay, someone can say Peter Schiff can get on and say there's no value in Bitcoin, and that's his opinion. And one thing I'll say to him: Are you 100% certain, Peter? Because you know, for the last you know 10 years, you've been so wrong on this. You've caused <laughs> so many people so much money. Yeah, 100% certainty is a is a horribly dangerous position. You got to mm. play probabilities. You got to do probability expected value analysis. But it will take time. For this to happen, um, it's an expected value proposition, but markets are truth. Okay, right now Bitcoin has a value of X, mm. and that's what the market is telling you. Is there intrinsic value behind it? Yes, I absolutely think there is. Peter Schiff absolutely doesn't think there is. There will be a reckoning on one side or the other, but all I know is the probabilities line up in my favor because. It's an asymmetric return distribution to the upside. And hedge funds and a lot of smart money is realizing this. Okay, Sonny? People that own fixed income bonds of debasing fiats are realizing that this is a game that's rigged against them. They actually need to own Bitcoin as a hedge to their fixed income exposure. Okay? Every single fixed income manager in the world can reduce portfolio risk by owning Bitcoin. It's very simple. Portfolio insurance in the form of Bitcoin will enhance your returns and reduce your risk. Oh my it's goodness. Starting, it is yeah. starting to leak out there. People are starting to understand this and it's led by very smart people Tudor mm. Jones. Yeah, he didn't just fall off the turnip truck. Okay. He says, I'm going to bet on the fastest horse. There's no disputing that gold has held that mantra for 2,000 years. But gold versus Bitcoin, in my opinion as well, there's no comparison. Bitcoin is just so much better, it's so much cheaper on a market cap basis. And as a trader who's been paid to take smart risks, not certain risks, but smart risks their whole time, their whole career. I like Bitcoin. I like it for the asymmetric return distribution. I love the upside from here. <laughs> well, yeah, hundred percent on that one. Um, okay. So, so like I was saying, and so I like, you know, kind of capturing people's stories, right. Which we, which we did a bit of, and then the really the second part is kind of around projects. So you alluded to, you know, kind of your involvement uh, with three IQ a bit, but, uh, but I think you were, you were mentioning that there's, there's been some other, um, you know, projects that you've invested in and that you're interested in as well. Are you open to sharing about some of that? Or? So before we go there though, uh, one thing I yeah, want yeah, to mention yeah. And, and you're a leader in the Bitcoin community in Canada. And one of the things I've found, and I've only been on uh, Twitter for uh, the last six months of my career. God knows why I never was on this before, because it's an amazing <laughs> source of information. There's a lot yeah, of great. banter and a lot of chess beating on mm. at times. But I, it, by and large, I find the Bitcoin Twitter community to be a wealth of knowledge and, and you know, quite honestly, very educational and willing to bring people along the uh uh, just down the rabbit hole or just along the learning curve, if you will. So before I go, I want to, I've, I've, I've shouted out to uh, uh, Sean Cumbie. I mean, the guy's amazing. He now is running a fund called Arx Novum. Mm. Arx Novum stands for, Nova means new and Arx means citadel in, in Latin. It's a new citadel. And he has a Bitcoin exchange traded product, exchange traded fund filed at the Ontario Securities Commission. Today, Bloomberg Intelligence came out with a report saying Canada could be the first 
exchange listed ETF, true ETF, not a closed end fund like 3IQ offers, a true ETF for Bitcoin in the world. My money's on Sean, okay? He's already done it against the OSC or, you know, not against the OSC as much as here's your concerns, Mr. OSC, and here's why you're wrong and why you should accept a closed end Bitcoin fund. And he won. Now he's promoting an ETF. The difference between an ETF and a closed end fund is somewhat subtle, but at the end of the day, an ETF is much more efficient for uh, mom and pop investors. Right now, uh, the closed end Bitcoin funds in Canada traded a premium to net asset value. That means Canadians are actually paying more for the fund than the underlying assets in the fund. And that's not a bad thing, except why pay $1.20 for something that's only worth a dollar, right? So the ETF will, will uh, uh, compress that premium down to zero and it'll be the first one in the world if Canada accepts it. And that's where Cumbie is now. So hats off to him. I wish him nothing but the best of luck. It's good for Canada. It's good for uh, our kids. The other person that I want to bring a beast. to is Jesper. <laughs> I love that. Okay, sorry, that's a that's a great one. Hey, is there a lot of echo? Because I kind of uh, on your side, is there some echo? It might be. You know, I'm again. I, I'm using a poor uh, microphone. Oh, it's okay. Me. It's okay. But yeah, sorry. Continue. No, I'm just saying. Sean is a beast. That's amazing. Like the project that you just mentioned. It sounds he did, like. And it. then and then um, Jesse Berger. I wanted to give a shout out to Jesse. Do you know him? He, he I interviewed was the him. Author, Canadian author of a book about Bitcoin. Yeah, I interviewed him. Oh. Awesome. The kid mm -hmm. is awesome. Um, the knowledge base is awesome. And then even uh, going one step further, have you, are you aware of uh, the Real Tahani's restaurant in London that put their treasury into, uh, it's a shawarma restaurant in, uh, in London, uh, Ontario. Okay. This guy's amazing. Okay. Um, and uh, he's just a Bitcoin uh He's part of the Bitcoin crowd, Canadian Bitcoin crowd. He's hosted a Bitcoin meetup in uh, in London, Ontario. Mm. And let me tell you, this is a community of really like-minded Canadians that are working hard to uh, to make opportunities for our kids. So what am I involved in now? Um, I'm exiting my position in 3IQ, my equity position. The fund itself is still rock solid. Uh, it does trade at a slight premium to net asset value, but let's not get fancy here. Uh, if something can go up a multiple of 10 times, which I think it can, uh, don't nickel and dime yourself and talk yourself out of a, an investment position because it's trading 10% higher than net asset value, okay? So through IQ, I'm exiting my position. I'm involved in a new project called Validus Power, which is a energy company, Canadian electricity uh, power company that um, builds data centers. And some of the uh, clients are Bitcoin miners. The marginal consumer of power of these data centers is uh, are the Bitcoin miners. So we have a, a real, uh, I would call it a, a similar interest in seeing Bitcoin succeed on that front. We have signed some deals with some Canadian miners or for some with some global miners to mine in Canada using very attractive rates of power using uh, natural gas uh, turbines, mobile turbines, 35 megawatt turbines, which are big projects. And uh, yeah, this is exciting for Canada because again, it's part of this whole vertical where energy is converted into a store of value called Bitcoin for consumption in the future. So valid is power, working with the, uh, the various government, uh, provincial governments in Canada to, uh, to bring more Bitcoin mining to uh, North America first. And then um, the uh, North America first and then Canada and the, provi the provinces uh, in, in uh, particular. Wow, that's fascinating. Hey, um, so you said that's in Alberta uh, as well, right? And 
you know, I, I was telling you about this, but I, I've been following this guy recently. I forget his name, Barber or something on, on the internet. Stephen He's, Barber, yeah. Stephen Barber. And I'm, I, I actually, actually just tweeted out his blog yesterday just because I'm like, just I'm blown away by kind of just the fact that this is even possible and that Alberta could maybe be at the forefront of this as well. Because I mean, I'm, I'm from Edmonton, right? I told you I was born and raised. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, if we're going to switch gears from talking to my mom to my dad, who spent his whole, you know, 40 years in the oil industry, um, and mo- like most of my family, I'm very, very interested to see how, um, you know, how oil and gas can potentially be, you know, intersect with this Bitcoin world. And it seems like there's more than a few test cases out there that are, you know, more than, a you know, kind of backyard projects or garage projects. It's like, how many megawatts did you say? 35? Well, that's one turbine. <laughs> um, we're, we're working on projects that uh, the data centers are, you know, six, seven, eight hundred uh, megawatt projects. Uh, hmm. Some of the, some of them are actually even bigger than that. Um, so Stephen Barber, yeah, hats off to him. He's he's uh, blazing a trail. Some of his projects, uh, you know, seem to be a little smaller, but it, it it doesn't miss the point. It's taking waste gas. So when you drill for oil, and oil is your primary uh, 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 your primary output or your primary target, there are uh, byproducts which include methane butane you know natural gas uh ch4 for those chemically inclined uh that basically gets flared into the they don't have a pipeline to collect this um there are regulations as to where, whether you can flare it or not based on how much oil you're producing at the end of the day though there's a lot of natural gas that's flared illegally Uh, I'm not saying in Canada per se, but certainly around the world. The point being, if you can take that source of energy and put a turbine engine, which is basically a jet engine that runs not on jet fuel, but runs on natural gas and create electricity to power mining rigs, you're converting waste energy into a revenue stream, provided you get your share of the uh, Bitcoin mining rewards. And it makes a ton of sense to me as an engineer, conservation of energy to you as an engineer, it should make a ton of sense. And to anybody in a position of power in any of the governments, this should make a ton of sense. On a per capita basis, Canada is one of the richest energy uh, countries in the world not just on a per capita basis, our oil sands reserves are larger than Saudi Arabia. You know that it's just that it's uh, what's called, uh, you know, pejoratively dirty oil. Value in a form of digital energy. It just makes too much sense to me from a, uh, an engineering perspective. It's so, it's just like poetry. Oh my goodness. Like I, I can't, uh, I can't describe how excited I am. I mean, just to, just to be talking about this stuff, like, you know, prime minister Harper's or former prime minister saying we should be maybe, you know, and then like, I think like, I you, watch you, that. I like watch if, it. Now let's, if, let's make sure if, we're, and, and let's be honest. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's make sure that there were, not I mean, it, it could not even be those. true. Like, I mean, in the sense that it could not even happen. But just the fact that a former oh, yeah. president is saying it to me is like, like what? Because <laughs> yeah, I was on a show a couple weeks ago with Ryan Selkis from Masari and all these guys. Sure. They'd invited me and they said, okay, what's your hot take? And my my thing at the end, I was just like, wait, what's the most outlandish thing you can think, Sonny? Central banks will start, you know, putting Bitcoin. Because I mean, like that, that, that to me is like, I don't know, a path where both worlds connect. And then yes. all of a sudden my dollars, which I think yes. of it is like monopoly money, I would actually look at my dollars and be like, there's something there now, you know? Yeah, that's probably not going to happen. In the central <laughs> banks. I've been I've been wishing for the Canadian, uh, the Bank of Canada to, to take this seriously. Um, not that I have high contacts there, but what is going to happen though, is Bitcoin miners are going to become the banks of the future. And then it may trickle up. Okay, Bitcoin miners will be the banks of the future. So I would argue at the ground floor, you get into Bitcoin mining. Those Bitcoin miners should look at expanding their portfolio. They should actually acquire an asset manager to begin with. So they have a natural place to put their mined Bitcoin. 
Imagine that. You mine Bitcoin and you put it into an asset managed exchange traded fund, no friction or very little friction between the uh, bid and the offer price because heck, it's a captive source, goes right up. You sell it into the asset management. You start making loans, Bitcoin denominated loans. You, your, your uh, fee based, you know, to do a uh, uh, fund transfer. I'm not sure if you've ever sat in line and tried to do a wire transfer at a bank, of course but it is are. so painful. It's not funny. You think <laughs> it was their money, not your money. Yeah, you yeah. Send it's money hilarious. around the world in 10 minutes mm -hmm. on a decentralized platform with no intermediary and extremely low fees. Bitcoin bank, excuse me, Bitcoin miners will become the banks of the future. Those miners that are forward looking. Now, the problem is most of those miners have market caps of less than a one billion dollars right now. And JP Morgan has market cap of 500 billion thereabouts. Um, it's not going to happen quickly, Sonny, but the logic is there. It's, it's there because efficient markets dictate that it should be there. If Canada embraces this on any level, it could define our future for years and generations to come. Yeah, you know, even Justin Trudeau's brother Kyle, I uh, had him on the show a couple, oh, yeah. a couple weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago. Yeah, he's 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 a huge Bitcoin fan. Like he's one of the most uh, like you know he's just all in. Um, but so I don't know, I don't know. But this is just exciting. I mean, the times we live in. I mean, like I said, like we talked about Michael Sunshine and you know these guys out in Alberta and the projects you're supporting. I mean, three IQ, and, and you know what it is? It's like it's all good. It's all good for Bitcoin. Like, that's what I think is sometimes people look at, oh, well, there's a competitor or something. No, it's all good. Like, it's like, it's all good. It's all good for Bitcoin. There's only so many of them. And, you oh, know, yeah. it's like. <laughs> it's pure mathematics, 21 million math and code. Do not mess with open source technology. You'll lose every single time. So here's what I would say, though, is it absolutely is good. Uh, Bitcoiners are some of the most optimistic people I've met mm. in this in the world at a time when there's a lot of you know unsettling and uncertain things happening, and they have they have reason to be optimistic. Uh, today's uh, article that I was reading in Bloomberg says that the incoming uh, chairman of the SEC, um, uh, Gary Gensler, <laughs> they are. They are speculating, well, he teaches a class at MIT called blockchain and money. Well, that's pretty cool. Having an SEC chairman that understands blockchain uh, will assume that he understands money. But the primary function of money, in my opinion, is not transaction based. It's store of value. And that's what layer one of Bitcoin is, is the store of value function. They'll build layer two and layer three functionality on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. Hmm. to make ease of transaction and uh, uh, you know plenty of plenty more than seven transactions per second uh, that the layer one allows so that it can compete with the other um, payment platforms in the world. But again, it's only 12 years old, so we got to take our time. But yes, optimistic people, optimistic as they should be, hmm. not 100% certain, but as every day goes by, the chance of Bitcoin succeeding actually increases. That's what people don't understand. Mm. Bitcoin becomes less risky every day that it survives. And there's actually a funny Twitter thing. I'm not sure if you've ever seen it. I think the handle is, did Bitcoin fail today? And then he'll send out a tweet. No, you know, <laughs> every single day. So all of these things, it makes people laugh, <laughs> but it's 100% it's it's true. It's, me true. it's memed its way into existence, you know, and it's just like, oh, by a suit. I mean, the story is so, so perfect. I love it. Um, hey, hey, Greg, uh, anything, any other projects you want to talk about or share before we move on to like, kind of the next question here? Uh, you know, all I will say is this. Um, my, my life in finance, uh, I, I, I tend to, tended to be on the, you know, a bit of the, the fringe with high yield bonds in Canada when... Um, Ted Rogers was the largest high yield borrower in Canada. 
uh, excuse me, in the world based in Canada. And I was a high yield trader and I was trading mostly US dollar denominated debt of Canadian companies. But Ted Rogers did not need any US dollar debt because he had no US dollar revenues. But Canadians would not buy the bonds of Ted Rogers at a 12, a 10 to 12% coupon, but they owned the equity. Now, Sonny, you tell me anybody who owns a subordinate claim because an equity is always a subordinate claim to the bonds who will not buy the bonds because they're junk bonds, but owns the equity, super junk equity. Well, that was Canada 20 years ago. I don't own bonds, they're junk. I only own equities. Well, hold on. If you own the equity of a junk bond company, de facto, you own a super junk equity. Now, how many can I sell you if you already own the equity of the company? Surely you're comfortable with the bonds, which are a senior claim, meaning if the bonds aren't worth 100 cents on the dollar in the event of default, the equities were zero. Simple finance 101. I called an account in Canada 20 years ago. We were trying to bring a Canadian dollar deal for Rogers Communications. They owned $900 million of Rogers Common Equity. Why? Because it was a TSX 60 company on the, on the Toronto Stock Exchange and their benchmark was the TSX 60. And that's how much Rogers Communications stock they needed to own to level up to the benchmark. $900 million. How many bonds can I sell you? Clearly you have confidence in the company. Zero. Well, why? You don't like the price? You don't like the coupon? No. It's a junk bond, non-investment grade. I can't buy it. Like I was blown away. I'm on the phone. Okay. Let's just play a game. Why uh, you're not buying it? You could actually sell some equity, buy the bonds, treat the income on the bonds like the dividend you're not getting on the equity, reduce risk, trade up in the capital structure. You already own 900 million. Can I put you in for any? Nope. What if I gave you the bonds, Mr. Account ABC? What if I gave them to you for free? I would not take them. I'd have to report to my investment committee. I owned a junk bond. That was 20 years ago in Canada. These are people who we pay to manage money and they're that foolish. All right. We really need to educate people about risk and return, about portfolio insurance. We need to educate people about the asymmetric return distribution on Bitcoin for every single Canadian. Run an expected value analysis on Bitcoin compared to where it can go to. And I'd be happy to walk you through the math. You're supposed to close your eyes and buy Bitcoin with both hands at this price, okay? This is the best asymmetric trade I have seen in 30 years of trading risk. Why? Again, expected value. So I'll run through it really quickly. I think that Bitcoin can go to at least $1 million per coin. Yeah, why? Okay. I believe simply, you, but why? <laughs> I don't think most people would. <laughs> okay. Well, Raul Paul, who I have tremendous respect for, mm -hmm. thinks it goes there. Michael Saylor thinks it goes to many multiples of that. But here's my simple analysis. Mm -hmm. Gold is $10 trillion. Uh -huh. If Bitcoin attained the market cap of gold, which mm -hmm. I think it should, given that Bitcoin's way better, that's 500000 a coin, US. Okay. Total financial assets in the world, including real estate, is $900 trillion US, okay. 900 trillion. That includes real estate, about 300 trillion. It What's includes- after a trillion? A zillion? What's uh, after a trillion? After a trillion, I actually know this. It's, it's, a, it's a quadrillion. Quadrillion, okay. Woo, yeah, that's a quadrillion. Dumb, dumb question, but, but, okay, but, but okay, quadrillion. Okay, wow, trillion. 900 trillion, okay. 900 trillion, 300 trillion worth of real estate, about 300, worth, 300 trillion worth of global debt, Mm. At a hundred trillion worth of equities, so we're at seven trillion, uh, seven hundred trillion. Uh, uh, currencies, you know, another fifty trillion. Uh, gold, the ten trillion. Art, all these other assets. You get, you easily get to, uh, you get to nine hundred trillion. Okay. Is it crazy to think that Bitcoin could someday be worth five percent of that? Not hundred no. percent certainty, but is it crazy? No, no. it's not crazy. No, so okay. what's 5% five, 5 of 900 trillion? Going to put you on the spot. I'll answer for you. You know the answer, 45 trillion. 
Okay. What's 45 trillion divided by, 20? by 21 million? That's about two and a half or two and change million dollars US per Bitcoin at a 5% penetration level. So at 10%, it'd be $5 million a okay. coin. Look, let's, mm. these are not, these are outrageous sums of money, but they're not 0% it's possible. probability. It's possible. So how about this? How about we, we play the math game though? And I say, how about you give me a 20% chance it goes to a million dollars a coin and I'll give you an 80% chance it goes to zero. That's a binary <laughs> distribution, only two mm. outcomes. In reality, mm -hmm. it's a continuous distribution, but for mathematical purposes, we're playing a game. 80% it goes to zero, Peter Schiff. Peter Schiff thinks it's 100%. Okay, Peter, you're wrong. Nothing's 100% certain. And you give me a 20% chance it goes to a million. So 80% times zero, you know your statistics, 80% times zero, to calculate an expected value is zero and 20% times a million is $200,000. The expected value of that binary distribution is $200,000 a coin and it's trading at 40,000. What are you supposed to do, Sonny? Based mm -hmm. on that analysis, you're supposed to wave it in, okay? So, my analysis gets a little more in depth and a little more exciting because I don't stop at a million. I can go out to crazy, crazy high numbers. When you're talking about 900 trillion in assets because of all the printing of money and everything, hey, look, you got to examine these. And that's why I think that everybody needs to. What is that high number? I beg your pardon? What is that number? Just curious. Uh... Well, we, we already went to 2 million, right? How about if Bitcoin gets 20% of 900 trillion? Mm. You know, look, I don't even want to go there because right now it's trading under 40,000. And and what what if that 900 trillion turns into 1.8 quadrillion? Okay. Yes, exactly. That's just asset inflation. So <laughs> the all present value billion dollars of Bitcoin. Okay, so <laughs> I'm just whatever. I mean, yes, I just I like your style. You know, I my, like my your style. Yeah, yeah. My, my thing is, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of feel like it's buy. It's like a. It's whenever I get Bitcoin, I feel like I'm buying a piece of freedom. So when people say, when like my mother in law or whatever, when someone's like, "Oh, you guys should sell. Like this is the time to sell," I'm like. Why would you sell freedom? Like, I just don't get it. <laughs> so it or, has no price. <laughs> why would you sell something yeah. with a fixed supply for something that has the ability to be debased to eternity? And that's what's going to happen. So I want to stress to you that I've analyzed balance sheets my whole life. It is mathematically <laughs> impossible, mathematically yeah. impossible for the US dollar to escape this debt spiral. Once again, the debt is growing so fast and the coupon on the debt is adding to the debt balance so fast that your economy will never outgrow the debt spiral. Well, There's Janet the Janet Yellen will surely put an end to this. <laughs> Uh-oh, did it freeze? Hey, uh, Greg, are you there? Awkward moment. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm recording. I'm sorry. Sorry. Where did you said you said Janet Yellen would would put an end to this. Hold on one sec. Yeah, yeah, no, I was just kidding. No, it's not. It's true. Well, listen, she won't. In what respect will she put an end to it? Meaning, like, put the nail in the coffin? Well, yeah. yeah. Maybe put the nail in the coffin. <laughs> so here, yeah. I'm gonna just get that connection right now. Sorry about this, Sonny. This is horrible. We're back. Cool. Okay, so Janet Yellen, uh, you know, <laughs> she could put an end to this as, as in put the nail in the coffin. Yeah. Uh, th these modern monetary theorists, uh, they're not great at math, Sonny. They've never traded credit in their lives. They're not great at math. They have subjective opinions. I'm not saying Yellen is an mmt -er, but there's a lot of people out there with MMT uh, opinions that uh, it's very dangerous. It is, man. I agree with you. I And now they're talking about the new Bretton Woods thing. They're talking about a lot of, I don't even know. It's, 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 it's confusing. Um, but how do we get here? Anyways, that's another story. I mean, like, how, do we, how do we get to this place where people are just bought into this like you know figment, why? like this imagination? Because mm. people trust central banks 
not to print money and central banks have a natural inclination to print money to solve problems. Very simple. They have kicked the can down the road in 2008 and they should have let the Lehman's and the Bear Stearns as well as a lot of other financial institutions fail, but they didn't and they transferred that financial leverage in the banking system to the balance sheets of federal governments around the world. Mathematics. Man. You know, if you don't take your medicine, you're going to regret it in the future. The medicine was very painful at that time, but it's going to be far more painful in the future unless you own Bitcoin. Unless you own Bitcoin, baby. Uh, okay, so let's switch gears. Um, so like I'm saying, um, okay, so my third question is really around, it's kind of a rip off of Peter Thiel's question, right? Which is a contrarian belief. So what is one truth that you hold that most others in Bitcoin or, you know, that have, uh, that are going down this path would disagree with you on? Wow. Uh, so you, you did give me a partial warning on this and I haven't even come up with a good answer, but I'm going to try. Okay. So Bitcoin Twitter is like, uh, man, they put you in your spot, right? <laughs> you, you, I, so I will confess I'm a Bitcoin maxi. I love blockchain for one blockchain only, and it's called Bitcoin. Mm. Uh, but I'm no computer expert, and I'm not going to tell people that there's no value in Ethereum when Ethereum is trading without market cap of 150 billion. That's just going to be stupid. I'm going to look like an idiot. Mm. I will tell you that um, I'm invested in a company in, in out of uh, Los Angeles, invested in the equity of the company called Arca. And it's really a cool product because it's... Uh, it's uh, managed, it's digital assets managed by a CIO who I used to trade high yield bonds with. And the CEO is actually uh, Rain Steinberg, who was, a, was amongst the family of Steinbergs in the US that founded Wisdom Tree. So these guys aren't, you know, these guys are really smart guys. And I bought a portion of the equity of the company, small portion, but out of Canada. Um, about four years ago as well. So I believe in the fact that there could be more than one winner uh, on various things. I think there'll be a lot of shit coins. I think that a lot of frauds can graduate to this uh, ecosystem. But if you have a professional manager managing uh, risk on certain token projects and, and that, I'm not going to tell you they're not going to be uh, successful. I am going to tell you that I know how to manage my Bitcoin exposure and I'll do it by myself. But these other asset managers, uh, they will find other projects that work. There will be other asset managers that say, oh, you got to get into Ethereum only because uh, they'll say, I'm an asset manager and I want to attract people to the ecosystem. And I can't tell them I hate the second largest uh, coin out there by market cap. So, you know, you got to be really careful. So all I'll say is there could be more than one winner. I believe Bitcoin will be the winner as a fiat substitute, 100% hard cap supply. The ETH heads don't even know what their true supply is with their coin. But I'm not saying that Vitalik, the Canadian, uh, didn't have something uh, up his sleeve when he brought uh, the Ethereum protocol uh, to the community. Uh, I'll just say that... Uh, you know, I want, uh, my focus is on Bitcoin. Uh, I believe in Bitcoin as a substitute and as a hedge to the fiat shenanigans that are going on, central bank shenanigans. And everything else is a bit of a different asset class, okay? So you got your Bitcoin and then you got everything else. And there could be some winners over here. I'm not going to tell you what they are. I'm going to spend my time on layer one, layer two, layer three protocols of Bitcoin because I believe it is the purest form of monetary energy and the only true use of a blockchain uh, that with, with, needs decentralization uh, and, you know, uh, gov no governance essentially, but governance by the people and the decentralized nation, nature of it over the, across the world. Uh, these other platforms don't offer that same uh, attraction to me. But there could be some winners there too. So, Bitcoin maxis don't come after me too hard. <laughs> I just want to point out that uh, you know no one can ever be a hundred percent certain about anything. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's wise advice, and I 
don't think I can disagree with you on a lot of your sentiment there. Cause uh, you know, I've been front row and center with Ethereum. I have a lot of respect for them. I'm all for innovation and in the free market ultimately. Um, and, you know, I've even interviewed Anthony Diorio. He's a guy that I consider sure. a friend of mine. Um, and, you know, I tweet back and forth with Vitalik's dad, at least Vitalik doesn't follow me anymore. He used to, uh, uh-huh. but, uh, but no, I just, you know, I got nothing but love for them, but, but yeah, but I do, you know, sometimes in life it, it helps to take a stand because it's, it's easier to view the world when you take a position. Right. And, and sometimes, you know, you're willing to change that position, but I've taken that, that, that position as a, and it's funny because the word Bitcoin Maximus, I think was invented by Vitalik or Vitalik and co. Um, so it's, I think it's actually got a bit of a, like a derog, not derogatory, but like a negative kind of sense to it, but I actually like it. Um, and, and I like taking it because yeah, like, you know, I, I recently, I don't know if you saw Peter McCormick did a, a beautiful interview between uh, Vitalik and Samson Mao. And it was just this, you know, intellectual like debate about a while like, ago, right? A while ago, though. I don't know. It's a couple months ago, maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe, months. yeah. Okay, for me, and... that's a long time because again, I've only been on Bitcoin Twitter for uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for a couple of months, you know. And and ultimately, what it came down to, what and in Vitalik is the one that says it, is that Ethereum doesn't stand for something. It doesn't have something it stands for. You know what I mean? Like Bitcoin is very clear that it stands for something. We just talked about for two hours, hour and a half, like what it stands for and monetary policy and money printing. And it's not like technology. It's just like, it's like, there's, there's, it's like a movement, if you will. And technology is kind of just like. It's technology, baby. It's technology. It's It's storing, (laughs) it's storing monetary and work energy for the future. If that's not technology, I don't know what is. And you can transfer it, divide it, it's portable. It is beauty and it's technology. That's what money has always been. The Mm. ability to store your work and time and your energy from today and consume it in the future. Bitcoin is the most beautiful technology for ever doing that that I've ever seen. But (laughs) it's, you could say it's not programmable. It's not a layer one, it's not. But, you know, if you put Jack Mahler's up against Vitalik, man, oh, man, you'll get a nice uh, discussion. Let me tell you, okay? Jack Mahler's from Strike, Lightning Strike Network. That kid is unbelievably brilliant. And he ripped Vitalik apart on a number of uh, Bitcoin threads that I watched. But that's okay. Mm. Doesn't mean that you can't have more than one winner. And that's all I'm saying, okay? I, uh, Anthony Diorio is... You know, I've never, I've seen him at various functions, but look, yeah, I, yeah. Will, I will, I will absolutely applaud these guys for creating value or the perception of value long run. Let's we'll see. see. Let's yeah, see. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. Okay. So I guess the contrarian belief question then, if you had to sum it up, what would it be then? It's uh... hopefully that you can trust people who manage money to differentiate between where there's true value versus, hey, I'm launching this fund in Ethereum or Litecoin or some of these other uh, Dash are part of it just because they rank in the top 10 of the market cap of the uh, altcoin universe. Um, There's a lot of people out there that that are managing digital assets that have to have exposure to that. And I I will also say that includes the Winklevoss uh, brothers at Gemini. You know, they got into Bitcoin. They're the Bitcoin billionaires, but, you know, they're supporting Ethereum. Uh, In my opinion, they're supporting it because they have a great custody solution, but they probably have a a vested interest because, you know, it's good to see Ethereum and generate fees on Ethereum as well, right? (laughs) So you gotta, you gotta, you gotta basically separate the, you got to separate the wheat from the shaft yeah. a little bit, right? It's- you know, you know the I, I got to like to just to pay credit where credit is due. I I, I got to admit though, I I am I am impressed with uh, Uniswap and these decentralized exchanges. I mean, you can complain about how they're expensive and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Hey, did I lose you, uh, Greg? No, no, you're there. Again. Sorry, I lost you again. Oh, I'm it's okay. Really it's okay. Apologetic about my internet connection. Oh, it's all good, man. It's all good. It's okay. Um, no, I was gonna say is that um, no, no, no. I, 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 I do like the idea of dexes in general, right? And, and, and the decentralizing applications, like why I can't, I don't have anything against that either. And so, I, I do think that you know, and I, I agree that it can be done on Bitcoin. But that's the beauty of it is like you, you don't have to be like either or. 
like both experiments are being run out in parallel. Like this is the beauty of the free market, right? So, so I, I no hate. Um, I've done a little bit of coding in my life, but I'm no, I'm not, I'm not an engineer, uh, a computer engineer by any means. Okay. I'll leave that to the experts. I've run financial risk and man managed financial risk for 32 years. Uh, I'll, I'll speak on things I have the, uh, you know, the experience to speak on. And we didn't touch on credit default swaps. And one thing I wanted to mention to you, Please. if you have two seconds. Yeah, yeah, of course. We got another, we got, we got a bit of time here still. I believe that a very interesting way of measuring the value of Bitcoin would be to take the credit default swap rate for every sovereign nation in the G20 and multiply it by its funded and unfunded liabilities and come up with a cumulative basket of what default protection would be worth on that met metric and then realize that Bitcoin is actually default protection on a basket of sovereign credits and fiats. Okay. Very simply, let's run through the United States as an example. Okay. The United States has about $30 trillion worth of funded debt outstanding. Okay. This does not include state municipal debt, just federal debt. And they have about $160 billion, excuse me, $160 trillion of Medicaid and Medicare obligations. So you have $190 trillion of U.S. obligations to its citizens and default protection on the U.S. right now is trading around 14 basis points. So if you multiply 14 basis points times $190 trillion of obligations, you come up with a number of about $250 billion. Well, if you did that in cumulatively across all the sovereign nations that trade at wider default spreads but have lower obligations like Canada trades at 36 basis points default insurance <laughs> there's people that are betting Canada is a default risk now that's that's crazy to people that have managed bonds their whole life and have only concerned themselves with interest rate risk but nonetheless you run through it with Canada Germany Britain Italy all the way down the line of G7s, all the way through the G20s. Um, I'm highly confident that uh, the number, in fact, I know the number will come up to more than the current market cap of Bitcoin. That means to me, Bitcoin's still cheap even on that metric. And what happens if the United States widens from 14 basis points to places that it's been in the past, like 20 and 30 basis points? Well, the number just grows. So if you're a fixed income manager, you can either buy protection on a basket of sovereign currencies and uh, bonds, or you can own Bitcoin. Very simple. I think there's a, a bit of a, a, a moral, I mean, uh, yeah. I think people can draw the, the connection here. Hey, I want to bring up one more thing. Um, sure. Michael Saylor, because you, you, you talked about him a few times, he, he said something the other day that like made me almost literally fall off my chair. He was, because you know, there's this narrative around like the black swan, right? The, the Nassim Taleb approach, where it's like, you put 99% of your money and assets, investment into like the most secure thing you could ever find. And then you put one or 2% in something super risky, i.e. Bitcoin. But then he was like, look, but then he's like, that's if you would have even asked somebody a while ago. But he's like, if you would have even asked him at the beginning of this year about Bitcoin, he would have probably said, like, I don't even know what it is um, to some extent. Yet, well, that's what I heard. I don't know. But yet, 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 wait, wait, he, that's what he said in one of the interviews, I think it was, it was Chang Peng. And, and, and then he goes on to say, whereas now he sees it as this, I think though his words were like an engineered treasury asset where yeah. we go from a world of like 1% of 1% to now maybe being 50% of like everything type of deal. And that was like, what, what is he saying here? Like, like, you know, you were talking about 20% of everything. Like, what about 50%? Like, could you imagine if Bitcoin literally ate the world? <laughs> So, you know, it, there are other hard assets that it won't eat. Like it won't eat real estate, but will it eat treasury assets? Will it eat sovereign debt? Will it eat, uh, you know, the, the typical 60-40 portfolio, which was 60% equities, 40% bonds. I mean, that portfolio doesn't work anymore, right? With interest rates close to zero or 1%. That 
forty percent is basically it's a contractual obligation that'll pay you one percent over the next ten years. That's mathematics. You're not going to make twenty percent out of a one percent coupon. It's not going to happen. And you need to find a replacement for that assumed rate of return in that 60-40 portfolio. So look, yeah, it could go way higher, like 50%. I'm, not, I'm just going to tell you right now, it's so minuscule on a global basis that the upside is still extreme. Michael Saylor has been, though, did look at Bitcoin back in 2013. He it is, is okay. looking at this asset. What he does know is network effects, and he does know when something reaches a critical mass, mm -hmm. then it has staying power. And for him, it's my understanding that when he first looked at it, he didn't believe. He believed the risks outweighed the returns. Now he believes the returns outweigh the risks. And he's, again, a, one of the, he's a brilliant engineer. He's pretty darn smart treasurer because he bought uh, $425 million of Bitcoin for his company. Then he bought 200 million of it for himself. Then he went out and borrowed money to buy another $600 million of Bitcoin. This is not a, uh, a stupid man or a man that's afraid of, of managing risks as he believes uh, uh, are appropriate. So, you know. And Greg, uh, just the, the pink elephant, you know, Tesla, uh, Elon Musk recently, I don't know if you've been following on Twitter, he's been talking about it. And you got Apple, you've got these Googles of the world, right? That, you know, I was at the, you know what the OECD is? I always talk about this, but I was in Paris well, last year. Sure. Do you know what the OECD is? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was actually at the uh, blockchain event last year with like all the regulators and everything. And, and this is one of the uh, the topics as well. But, uh, but, but just curious. Um, hey, you know what? I sorry, I just looked at the time here as well. I just realized, wow, we're wow, it's been like, uh, we only have a few minutes left. Okay. I, you know what, I wanted to switch gears, I just asked you a couple uh, other slightly <laughs> tangential questions, but really curious where you sit on them. Uh, the first one is AI. Uh, do you have much familiarity or interest in that area? Do you think it's something that you know, will become more relevant uh, in the upcoming years? I mean, you do see- I'll leave that to the experts, but I did just finish a book uh, written by Jeff Booth. Uh, have you read that called The Price of Tomorrow? He's no. a Canadian, brilliant kid, Vancouver based. Hmm. He, he talks about AI in there and I'll let, I'll let you read the chapters and you, you guys tell me what you think, but I'll just say that, uh, again, I'll leave that to the experts. So. I'm an engineer. Do I believe in that? Yes, there's varying levels of uh, of uh, distinction. Yeah, uh, but I'm 100 percent. Yeah, um, and uh, and you know, also I wanted. Well, okay. Uh, anywhere, okay. Just before we maybe let people go as well, I wanted you to share where people can you know kind of tap into your consciousness. You said you you're on Twitter now. Are you uh, blogging a bit? Is you have like a personal website? Also, I don't know any sort of uh, other you. websites you want to plug. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I I, I I have decided I'm going to write. So I was on another podcast, uh, local Toronto. It was actually a real estate podcast that they've uh, tang uh, you know moved into uh, other hard assets. They're called Rockstar Real Estate, based in Oakville, and I was on their podcast three times. One in time with Jesse Berger. And after I was with Jesse, I realized, you know what, I'm going to start writing a little, uh, I'm going to start writing not the equivalent of a blog and not the equivalent of a, a book, but I need to put my 30 years of experience into some writing so people can uh, digest it themselves and, and, and determine whether I even have a brain or not, uh, whether I should be talking on this subject. So I've done, I've done one installment of a total of four installments I'm doing linked up to their page. Uh, I have cool. it is posted on Twitter. I'm gaining some followers on Twitter. Um, it will be posted on the validistpower.com website in due course as well. But yeah, no, listen, Sonny, I think I have a unique perspective on this uh, from a risk manager in the financial markets for 30 years. Global financial markets. I traded risk on Wall Street, on Bay Street, with all the biggest funds in the world. Um, this is coming. It's coming quickly. And I just want to put my opinion on paper and then advise people, hey, no one's 100% certain. I'm giving you one of many potential outcomes. So, yeah, I'm on Twitter. My handle is at Foss, Greg Foss, F-O-S-S, G-R-E-G, F-O-S-S. -S. Okay, that's awesome. Hey, I was going to say, have you heard of Substack? 
I have heard of it, but I can't even tell you what it is. It's, it's like, you, you know how newsletters are becoming a really big thing again, right? Like they're emerging as like, there's like a massive trend. And I was just going to say, when you were saying you wanted okay. to write, um, you might want to look at something called Substack. I appreciate sub, that. Substack, because they, they did, from what I'm hearing, it's like kind of the way to to do that, you know? And, and people appreciate. can charge, you know, pay as little as I think five bucks or something a month to more to whatever you want, essentially but you can you can um you know you can own your email list and 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 you know at the end of the day with twitter and everything google youtube you don't really own it right you know what i mean yeah. like it's not really your platform and you can always be deplatformed as we've seen yeah. recently even uh you know the most powerful uh, person on earth can be deplatformed as we've seen right i've seen it yeah <laughs> well that decentralization yeah. will come uh that 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 platform will become will come in the form of a decentralized platform someday but uh yeah. So for now, well, I appreciate that on Substack. Again, I don't want to do this on an ongoing basis, like write a newsletter. I'll just, I'll data dump all this stuff. The conclusion is, as I mentioned before, Sean Cumby and I are working on an index that will measure credit default swaps against outstanding obligations of the various G20 countries. We'll come up with a number, that number will be dynamic. And that number should be a short-term valuation of what Bitcoin should be worth today. And people who trade credit default swaps need something called an ISDA, International Swaps Dealers Association Agreement. Trust me when I say most Canadians don't have, most Canadian pension funds don't even have ISDAs. These are for the big money, sophisticated hedge funds of New York and London that trade risk. But you don't need an ISDA to own Bitcoin. Same outcome, buy something, hold a puddle, however you want to call it, and don't trade it back into this thing called fiat, which is guaranteed to debase. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it seems like uh, all the smart like institutional and you know like the smart money if you will they're 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 really woke now you know what i mean if you will or starting to get woke but you know retail uh, the average and, and when i say i hate the word average but like you know the, the the average person i use facebook as a gauge for that and in my facebook circle i don't think anybody cares about bitcoin like i i don't think it's i don't okay. i mean yeah maybe my mom and my dad and a couple of friends here and there that i've been talking about it for 10 years like they're like now going hey okay i, I was totally wrong to not buy it at five dollars or whatever it was um but by and large i don't i don't feel like there's some sort of like you know crazy phenomenon going on but when i talk to guys like you i talk to guys like michael sun and shine i'm hearing oh my god institutionals are you know institutions are only but yeah. suddenly we're on the s curve okay mm. we're only at the very bottom part of the s curve we haven't even gone parabolic yet it's something like 1.8 percent penetration right now guys it's still early the world was set on its ear because of COVID. Uh, printing money was a sort short-term solution, but mathematically, fiats are programmed to debase. Again, it's only math. Don't fear mathematics. Embrace mathematics. Yep, I couldn't couldn't agree more. Love that. Um, okay, well, Greg, I think that's good. No, is there anything else you wanted to share before we? You know, I was gonna say I really enjoyed this. If you want to reconnect in the next uh, couple of weeks, whenever you're free again, I'd love to. You know, keep the conversation going. And it seems like every day there's just so much stuff happening in our space that, oh, I, I'm just bubbling with excitement, man. <laughs> I'll get a better internet. I'll get a better internet connection. Uh, we can go out and we live in the same vicinity. I look forward to sharing some, uh, some I'm in Oakville uh, now. beers with you and talking about this. But yes, I'd love to come back. I wanted to thank you very much for, for inviting me. Um, yep. It's a pleasure. I believe I have a message that's, uh, that's important. Again, uh, it's important for our financial institutions, uh, our pension funds and everybody. They Even if they move 2 or 3% into this, it will just, it, it's not easy because it's, you know, to move that much money, if you have a basket that's like hundreds of trillions of dollars in size and there's only 21 million coins representing a market value of 700 million right now, it's like marshmallows into a piggy bank, okay? Like you just got to be really understand that when this money comes, <laughs> it's going to squish everything else out of the room. 
Um, but it has to come because it's only mathematics. So thank you again. Thank Anyone you. Who has any questions for me? And by the way, I love questions that tell me I'm a fool because you always got to learn. But for now, I really believe I'm on the right side of this trade. Hey, uh, just before I let you go, Raul Paul. He seems like he's sliding down that 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 slide of uh, you know other coins and assets. Do you think it's I guess uh, he's any any thoughts on that one? I'm gonna try and get him on the show. By the way, yeah. I I think Raul Paul is a very smart man. I also think he manages risk extremely well using expected value uh, analysis and whatnot. I've had some a few back and forth with him on Twitter. I know some guys that know mm-hmm. him very well. Mm. Uh, when he lived in Spain, some Canadians that have stayed at his, uh, at his villa in Spain, exa- for example. Yes, he's a really smart risk manager. Um, are there ulterior motives for him to get involved in some of these other coins? I'll leave it at that. I will just <laughs> tell you, if you're managing a digital asset platform, but you only have one asset in that digital asset platform, Oh, maybe you're not really that diversified, right? My only digital asset that I manage myself and I'm not managing money for anybody else is Bitcoin. So let's leave it at that. Yeah, I love that, man. No, I I, I can definitely get with that. And, you know, in just, in just closing, I probably said this like three times. Um, I have no problem with innovation. I love all of it. But when I think about freedom and I think about bringing freedom on earth, I, I, I think about solving the money problem. And that is one half of every transaction on earth. <laughs> so so if we don't money, solve money, yeah, sorry. Fix the money, fix the world. Marty Bent, okay? Fix the money, fix the world. He's a Bitcoin miner. He's a Bitcoin uh, podcaster. He's a brilliant kid. Uh-huh. Um, I think I've already hit him up. I'm going to get him on the show. I mean, I think he said he's he's down to come on or maybe he punked me off. I forget. One of the two. But yeah, I'm going to get him off. I will tell you, um, Raul Paul has been a very uh, vocal uh, and supportive of Bitcoin uh, because of the right reasons. Again, expected value analysis, Sonny. Um, No one can be 100% certain. I'm talking to you, Peter Schiff. I'm talking to you, Mark Cuban, who called Bitcoin bananas. Okay, you're smarter than that, you guys. You cannot be 100% certain and don't ever pretend you are because you're disadvantaging your your followers and people that listen to you, okay? I'm not saying you can't be more confident that Bitcoin is overvalued, but you cannot be 100% confident. Impossible. As much as I can't be 100% confident that it's going to those price targets that I have. Yeah, or that uh, you know other coins maybe aren't as valuable as they should be. Um, okay, sounds good, man. This was amazing, Greg. I know it's pretty late. Uh, like I said, let's do this again. You know, I would love to do a whole session on just risk because I am obsessed with the idea of risk and risk adjusted. Uh, you know, taking like everything is risk, right? Like if you're gonna it go talk to a girl at a bar, you're gonna go raise wow. kids, or I'm you're over there. But here's what I know: <laughs> Bill Miller turned yeah. it very eloquently. Mm. Everyone says Bitcoin is volatile, which is true. It's actually less volatile than a number of other assets in the world right now. But Bitcoin is very volatile. And Bill Miller would say, volatility is the price of return. Meaning if you have something that's not volatile, you won't get anything back, either upside or downside. And then somebody today said volatility is like anything that's alive is volatile. Anything that's Especially dead in is not. Day and age. <laughs> So Man. let's hope for good things. I, yeah. I'm, I'm a Bitcoin. Uh, I'm Bitcoin for Canada. I'm Bitcoin for the energy patch. I want you to get your dad on the phone and say, I just talked to this uh, lunatic in Oakville who uh, who thinks Bitcoin banks, uh, Bitcoin miners are going to be the banks of the future. And your dad is going to look at you and say, ah, uh, not 100% certain he's wrong. That's, I hope, what your father says. <laughs> I cannot well, be 100% certain that that idiot Foss is wrong. Exactly, exactly. No, I think, oh, I'm super pumped, man. Like I said, it's almost like a dream come, not even, I couldn't have even dreamed this. Like, this is just insane. Okay, Greg. I'm, I'm, good work, Sonny. You're doing great, great stuff. So thank you for the invite. All right, just stick around for 30 seconds. I'm going to kill this video here. And-